Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Urology Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning, we're going to have Dr. Michael Horowitz, who's going to discuss renal and bladder translational and clinical studies at Yale. Uh, Dr. Horowitz is an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Medical Oncology at the Yale University School of Medicine and co-leader of the Cell Therapies Disease Associated Research Team, as well as the associate director of the Hematology Oncology Fellowship. He attends in the Smilo Cancer Hospital Yale Cancer Center. He received his MD-PhD degrees from Tri-Institutional MD-PhD program at Wheel Cornell Medical College, the Rockefeller University and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, where his PhD was in cell biology at Rockefeller University. He completed a residency in internal medicine at New York Presbyterian Hospital and his medical oncology fellowship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Brigham and Women's Hospital, Mass General Hospital. He specializes in the treatment of urologic malignancies and the use of immune cell-based therapies. His research focuses on translational studies and clinical trials in these malignancies. Specific studies include analysis of immune checkpoint expression and immune cell infiltration in tumors and trials of novel agents, particularly adoptive cell and CAR T therapies. Well, thanks everybody for, for inviting me to, to talk here today. Um, as Dan said, I'm going to be talking about some renal studies and some bladder studies that we're, we're doing both in the GEO repository at Yale uh, and some clinical trials uh, that I think are somewhat relevant for, for, for this audience. Here are my disclosures. Uh, there are a lot of them that it sounds fancier than it is, but um, anyway. Okay. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about three different kind of groups of, of studies. Um, they're the, the the first one are translational studies that we're doing. These are very early. We just sort of began these, so there are there are not a lot of data yet, but uh, it, it it will give a sense of sort of some of the things you can do with a tumor registry, uh, which we have here. I'm also going to talk about uh, a retrospective study that we did looking at brain metastases in renal cell carcinoma. And again, this is really based on the database that we have. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk about some clinical trials that we're doing. Uh, in, in, in renal cell carcinoma. And I think a few weeks from now, Harriet Kluger is gonna talk more about clinical trials that are being done in renal cell carcinoma. And some of her work actually also in brain metastases that were very, very different from what I'm gonna describe. Uh, uh, I may be given, okay. Um, so let me just start by, by saying that not, almost none of the stuff that, are, that I'm talking about today aside from the clinical studies could be done without the GU repository. So the GU repository was set up, I think about nine years ago by Brian Schuck when he was here. And uh, there's a pr clinical protocol uh, which allows us, if the patients consent to it, to get blood and urine and tumor. Uh, in addition to that, and really important in this is clinical annotation of these samples, which is just a huge amount of work by the, by the people who work in the GU repository. Uh, and of course we can, once we have all this stuff, all these samples, then you know, we collab can collaborate with investigators at Yale, meaning a lot of you, um, or outside investigators to actually do tissue-based studies and database studies of our patients. To get a sense of how much we're doing in the last four months, well, I don't, I don't have uh, uh, May, but yeah, so far, but in the last four months, We've gotten about uh, just under 50 samples of blood, um, a lot less of tissue. Uh, it's hard to come by tissue because it has to go to pathology. Some of that tissue we can actually access anyway through pathology, but a lot of it we actually can't uh, because pathology uses it for good reason. Uh, but, but also because there's an embargo on a lot of uh, tissue until a few years have passed. And all this work is done by Ming, uh, Ming Lu, who, who really runs it and Melanie Allison, who works with Ming and does a lot of the database studies. Okay, so uh, the first thing I wanna talk about is the idea of looking at prognostic markers in localized bladder cancer. And you can imagine why this might be valuable, but just as a very, very quick review, how do we treat uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer? Well, just about everybody who can tolerate it goes through cisplatin-based chemotherapy, usually gem cyst, sometimes something called dose dense MVAC. And then after that, they get cystectomy. And new data that came out this uh, about two months ago at GU ASCO says that uh, there's a recommendation now that everybody get nivolumab, which is 
a, uh, an immune therapy. I'll talk a little bit about immune therapies later, which is total bread and butter for all oncologists now, but may not be as familiar to the non-oncologists. Uh, and, and, and so, so, so this is actually kind of new. Um, so when you look at all these things, one question that we have, if we're looking about prognosis is who's going to do well, right? Some patients are going to do terribly and some are going to do well. So how can we prognosticate? We can look at the T stage, tells us some information, histology tells us some information and lymph node involvement certainly tells us some information, but these are all actually very imperfect. And people are now looking at, at newer ways of looking at who is going to progress and who's going to do well. And one of the ways that there's been a lot of interest in lately is in cell free DNA. Um, and so what is that? So it turns out that in our blood, we have a lot of DNA that's circulating free and most of it comes from lymphocytes that are circulating in the blood, but some of it comes from tissue. And there is a subset in patients with cancer called circulating tumor DNA or CT DNA. And there was a, a really interesting study that came out uh, back in 2019 looking to see if we could use this cell-free DNA and looking for circulating tumor DNA to see who would progress. Um, so this is very long name of a paper of early detection of metastatic relapse and monitoring of therapeutic efficacy by ultra deep sequencing of plasma cell-free DNA. And what they did uh, in this study is they obtained blood from a bunch of patients after three time points, okay? These are patients before they got their neoadjuvant chemotherapy, so sort of like at diagnosis, before a cystectomy, after they've had their chemotherapy, and then after cystectomy, okay? Um, and then what they did is they, they looked to see who they can actually identify uh, um, CT DNA in, right? So anyone who they identify, so they, they, they basically just uh, dichotomized the patients into those who they saw circulating tumor DNA and in those they didn't. And I'm not gonna go into it in detail, but they had a pretty complicated way of actually figuring out who had the circulating tumor DNA and, and what, what that actually constituted. They ended up defining a 16 gene panel that they used to, to describe it. So, so look at the first panel here. These are people, this is looking at uh, circulating tumor DNA before chemo, right? So this is basically at diagnosis. And what they found is if you did not have circulating tumor DNA, if they couldn't detect any, then your probability of, of not relapsing, right? This is relapse-free survival was great. They only went up to about, just about three years, okay? Um, and overall survival was perfect in these patients. Then they also found this really for everything. So when they looked at, at after chemotherapy, people who still had circulating tumor DNA uh, did pretty badly, in fact, right? Their recurrence-free survival was actually quite low. Um, it was under a year. Whereas people who did not, people who they couldn't detect it, did extremely well. And of course, overall survival was similar. And lastly, the, probably the, the, the most interesting in a way is that if you had no circulating tumor DNA seen in your samples after cystectomy, none of those people recurred, all right? Um, granted, early days, only about three years, but still three years is actually pretty good for a disease like bladder cancer that's pretty aggressive. And as I said, they created the 16 gene panel to look for circulating tumor DNA, okay? All right, so this is all extremely interesting, but how do you actually use it? So could you use this to say, well, maybe these people don't need chemotherapy? Well, no, you can't say that um, because of course, every one of these patients got chemotherapy. All it tells you is that if you don't have circulating tumor DNA um, at, at the outset, you still might need chemotherapy, but at least you'll respond very well, right? Um, but, the, but what it probably does tell us, although we don't know this yet, if you look at panel C, um, you know, none of these patients in this study actually got nivolumab. Remember, that's sort of new. Everybody now should probably be getting nivolumab uh, if they can tolerate it. But this sort of indicates that maybe there's a subset of, of, of people who, if you give them chemotherapy, then you resect their tumor, take out their bladder, none of these people seem to need any more therapy. So this is the kind of information that really changes management. And, and so we were wondering, is there maybe another study we could do that would in fact change management? And before I get into that, um, yeah, and, and therefore, is there a better population to study rather than people who go through the standard chemotherapy and then cystectomy? 
All right. So before I get into that, let me say a little bit about circulating tumor DNA. So there are some real challenges in circulating tumor DNA. Um, and by the way, I wanted to say this slide is from my collaborator in this uh, study, a guy named Abby Patel. Um, you guys may know him. He's one of the radiation oncologists here. And he has a lab that works on studying circulating tumor DNA. That is the, his you know, entire, uh, almost all of his work is actually on coming up with assays to discover cancer in blood. Um, and he's done this across a, a wide range of tumors. Uh, and before I go on, I should say that, that, that what I'm going to be describing is work that we're collaborating also with um, someone named Tyler Stewart, who is a professor at uh, University of California, San Diego. He was a fellow here years ago, and he, he really came up with this project. So going back to circulating tumor DNA, um, you know, there are some real challenges with finding it. So one is that early stage tumors, and those are the ones we're most interested in, right? These are the ones where you have something local and you want to see if maybe you can use this information to find out who we can cure maybe with, with um, local therapy, like resection, for example, rather than with, with more therapy like chemotherapy. Um, also, there's a huge amount of normal DNA floating around, uh, made by lymphocytes again, or regular tissues that release some DNA. Um, and, and also, believe it or not, there are cancer-like signals that are produced in, in healthy DNA. There's something called clonal hematopoiesis, for example, where normal blood cells will actually make things that, that, that look like, they, they, like cancerous. In other words, they can have mutations uh, that do not actually mean cancer, but they look a lot like cancer. Um, technically, it's also very difficult to do. There can be artifacts, meaning there can be errors from uh, PCR, which we use to amplify the DNA. Um, and DNA damage. Also, again, related to the biological challenges, there can be low conversion yield. Um, and finally, you got to make sure that it's reasonable in cost um, and that you can do it in a large scale. So, as I said, the study that we were, that I showed you before, what they did is they looked at mutations in DNA, right? They came up with a 16 gene panel. Um, but the fact is that's 16 genes. It's not a lot of mutations per genome. Uh, and you can imagine that it may not be as sensitive as you want it to be. Um, another thing that you could look at are what are called epigenetic features. So our DNA, what we learned in, in med school, uh, of course, is that there's the ACTG. Um, there are a lot of these, right? Three billion base pairs. But it turns out that the DNA is being manipulated all the time, and it's actually being altered by chemical groups that are being bound to it, maybe the most famous one being methylation groups. Um, and we call those epigenetic features. Uh, and they are throughout the genome. Um, and in fact, methylation occurs almost always at what are called these CG dinucleotides. And there are huge numbers of these throughout the genome. Um, and many of them are methylated. Uh, and we can, we can find that. So it turns out that these methylation patterns uh, are really different in healthy cells versus in cancer cells. Um, and for example, in cancer, you may have a healthy cell where the promoter region, right, of a, of a gene. So here's a gene, the promoter region is where, uh, where the RNA polymerase II complex will sit on it, resulting in transcription of that gene to make that gene uh, into a protein eventually. Um, in a healthy cell, um, you may not have them bound by anything. These methylations can be bound by something. But in a cancer cell, maybe they are bound by things, not allowing this gene to be expressed. Uh, and we do find that. Uh, sorry, I got this slide from Abby. It's, I'm sure he has cooler things to say than I do. And it turns out that it's not just the promoter, but it's other parts of the gene. There, there are lots of areas in the gene that will have these methylation, um, methylation uh, uh, tags. And depending on the proteins that are bound to these methylation tags, it can result in either the gene being transcribed or not being transcribed. And in fact, as I was saying, it's not just in a single gene, it's throughout the genome that it turns out that cancer cells have very different methylation patterns from normal cells. And we can use that uh, to differentiate them from normal cells, all right? This is not new information. Um, here's a paper from 1983 where they discovered this. Um, so this is very well-established biology that's been studied again for, you know, 50 years, 40, 50 years. All right. Um, here's an example uh, that, that uh, Abby took from just a, a website that's available to everybody. These yellow bars represent uh, uh, methylation sites, okay? And you can see, for example, in the, this is 
a teeny part of the genome. It's a single gene called UNC5D. Um, and he shows that if you look in regular cells, like peripheral blood cells, B cells, neutrophils, or, or normal colon, in this one part of the gene, there isn't a whole lot of methylation. But if you look in cancer, both colon cancer and leukemia, there's a ton of methylation in that area. And as I said, and these are data directly from Abby, okay? So he did this in his lab. If you look across the entire genome, there's a lot of difference in the methylation patterns here versus in healthy, okay? Um, and uh, for, from, for the small amount of data I'm gonna show you of what we've done so far, I just wanna say that um, I'm gonna show things that look like this, and each one of these is a chromosome. So this is chromosome one, chromosome two, three, four, all the way through the end of our chromosomes. And literally, if you could um, dig down into this, and, and this could be expanded, literally this is every single base pair, all right? And that's what's represented here, every base pair in, 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 in sort of each one of these little areas, each one of these lines represents a, a, a megabase, one million base pairs. All right. All right. So, so getting back to the study that we wanted to do, uh, which is, you know, based a little bit on what was done by this group that I described before, but was somewhat different, is can we find a population of patients who are cured by surgery alone? Because in those patients, for example, we might be able to say you don't need chemotherapy beforehand. So they could get to surgery earlier. Uh, they wouldn't have to go through chemo, which could have long lasting effects. And there are some patients, a number of patients, in fact, who you, you can't give chemotherapy to. So we went into our GU repository um, and tried to find people for whom we had tissue and blood who had not gotten chemotherapy, but had gotten cystectomies. We didn't find a whole lot. There aren't that many, actually, because almost everybody does get chemotherapy. Um, and another reason we didn't find that many is that even though over the years we've gotten a lot of these samples, they've been used for other studies that have been done. Um, but doing that, we looked at methylation patterns from two areas of each tumor. Uh, and that was all done in the lab of Abby Patel, as I described, um, and with these collaborators. I should say that um, in addition to the ones I mentioned, Tyler and Abby, Brian Considine, uh, as a fellow working with me, did a ton of work on this also. All right. Um, so, so as I said, what we did is we took tumors that we had in our database, um, and we looked to see, we we took a sample from different parts of a single tumor. Okay, um, and then Abby Patel and his lab looked at the methylation patterns across the genome in each of these tumor samples. Okay, so this these two are both from the same tumor, different parts of it. These two are from the same tumor. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, one of these is a control, all right? Um, and the rest of them are from cancer tissue. Uh, and when we gave Abby these samples, we did not tell him which was which. Um, but I think you can tell really without even, even having to think that hard about it, which one of these is a control, uh, because it's so obvious that this is benign tissue, right? And you can really see that his assay, which, which has never been used in bladder cancer before, uh, very much distinguishes between control and, uh, and tumor, right? So even the one that looks a little bit like a control, when you actually dig down and look a little bit deeper, I, and I did this myself, I actually expanded them, there's actually a huge amount of difference here, even between this. But you can see massive amounts of differences between all the others. Um, and so, so at, at the outset, Absolutely, he can distinguish between cancer and benign. So what kind of conclusions can we make? Not a ton, it's not a huge number of samples, but I think it's relatively clear that you can distinguish, as I said, benign from metastatic, um, well, well from, from cancer. Um, and the other thing that was sort of notable is on these samples, it looks pretty clear that um, although th these, the two different samples from the same tumor don't look identical, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of variability between tumors, um, sort of among tumors versus between a particular tumor. So the two different parts of this tumor, while we know that within a tumor, there's a lot of, of genetic variability, the methylation patterns, um, it, it looks as though there's a lot of similarity in fact, okay? Um, so, so Abby did something else next, where he took one of these samples, okay, and he rearranged the sequence of them to have the least difference in methylation up to the most biggest difference in methylation. And so you get this hockey stick pattern. 
So again, this is the same information, actually. This is the same data. The only difference is that um, he is that he rearranged them by lowest to highest. And I think he took out some of the real ones that were way off. Okay. Um, and then what he did is once he had it like this, he rearranged all the other samples according to this one to see if it matched this one. Okay. And here's what it ended up looking like. So for the other part of the tumor, you can see that it also has the same kind of hockey stick pattern. So clearly there's a lot of similarity in the methylation patterns, but you can all see that there are quite a bit of differences, right? It doesn't look clean the way the other one does. There's a fair amount of variability. What about the other samples? So I think what you can find here is that obviously benign doesn't change. There just isn't a lot of uh, going up. But in all the other samples, you can also kind of see some more than others, that there's also this trend towards this. So it looks as though, you know, what can we kind of suspect? These aren't really conclusions, but it looks as though one, variability is very likely to be greater between tumors than within a tumor, right? This is a lot more similar than what you see, you know, from these to this one, okay. Um, and lastly, there is a lot of variability within tumors. Um, oh, sorry, but there does appear to be some consistency to methylation changes across bladder cancers. Um, and so this is really just the beginning of these studies, but I think there are some interesting things we've kind of discovered biologically already. Um, and and so, so what's the next step? The next step, of course, is to take the blood we have from all these patients and see if we can make the same findings. That is, will his assay be sensitive enough in blood to match what we find with the tumors? Um, and he's had a lot of luck doing this in other diseases, so I'm hopeful, but that's where we are right now. And then once that is done, assuming that this actually works out, then we're gonna wanna look at a, at a large group of patients who had cystectomies who did not get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Um, and for that, we would rely on the urology community here um, to sort of tell us about these patients and also to let us get blood from those patients. Okay. All right, um, the second very, very early stage uh, study that's, that's being done here um, is on a disease called renal medullary carcinoma, uh, which is, uh, really a horrible disease for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, it's a rare uh, kidney cancer. Uh, as you might imagine, it happens, it arises in the medulla of the kidney. Uh, essentially, it's unresponsive to all therapies. We use chemotherapy for it. You might get a very transient response. The median survival is five or six months. Um, and what's interesting about it uh, that, I, that we picked up on is that it's associated with a sickle cell trait. Um, so this is really found uh, in young, mostly men, not only, but mostly men who have either sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease, or sickle thal, one of the other sickle type diseases. Um, and also it's notable that, that most of these people, mainly the disease, actually all of them have lost um, a gene called SMARC1B. Uh, it's a remodeler of chromatin. It's not a different chromosome from the, from the globin gene. Uh, which is responsible for sickle cell disease, but they, they've lost it usually through deletion. Uh, the other thing that that's, I think is somewhat interesting about, uh, th that, that made me think about this disease, renal medullary carcinoma, is that there's another very similar disease called collecting duct renal cell carcinoma. Uh, again, in a similar part of the kidney, a very similar histology to renal uh, medullary carcinoma and a very similar clinical course, again, doesn't respond to things, people die very quickly, but it's not associated with sickle cell trait at all. And it's not also associated with the loss of SMARC1B. Uh, I can tell you that a study was done recently by a group at MD Anderson Cancer Center where they looked at a lot of features of these two diseases genomically. They did uh, whole exome sequencing, they did RNA sequencing, they did a lot of other uh, stuff. And what they found is uh, collecting duct and renal medullary are probably more similar to each other than any two other types of kidney cancers. So they seem similar, but there are real differences uh, genetically and, and in the patient populations. So we really have very little idea about what causes renal medullary carcinoma. There is an hypothesis out there that renal medullary carcinoma, uh, the reason it arises in the renal medulla is that the renal medulla is very hypoxic. And so um, in patients who have sickle trait, their, their, their red cells don't normally sickle. Uh, 
but they do uh, when they are in a very hypoxic environment. And there, are, there is in fact evidence that in the kidney or medulla, even patients who just have sickle trait who generally do well, they do get sickling. Uh, and so the hypothesis is that in the medulla, there's hypoxia, the results of sickling of these patients in the renal medulla, that actually increases hypoxia. And in the setting of a lot of hypoxia, we know there can be DNA damage. Um, that is, is, is well known uh, based on studies that were done at Yale, in fact, over the last 15 to 20 years by, um, uh, by Ranjit Bindra and, and uh, Peter Glazer and their labs, um, and that therefore it leads to this cancer in the medulla. So uh, we have an alternate hypothesis. Um, and, and you know the other sort of obvious thing about these patients is that sickle trait patients, they've got genomic mutations. Uh, right, they all have mutations in the globin gene, uh, and so the other possibility is that there are associated mutations near that globin gene that, at at a low level, that 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 some people have, and those people are the ones who might get renal medullary carcinoma. And so that's the question: Is there an associated genomic mutation? And there's a real simple test to do: just do whole genome sequencing on these samples. Um, as I said, there was a recent study doing a lot of genomic studies. The one thing they didn't do is look at whole genome sequencing. Um, so we're doing that. Uh, we went back into our GU repository uh, and found these samples on these different patients. So we got um, eight different patients. It's not that many, but as I said, there aren't that many patients. It's a very rare disease. So over the last, um, you know, 10 to 15 years, we look back at, at everybody who came to Yale. There were only 14 total, uh, and we couldn't get samples for six of them. In addition to that, I just want to point out that we weren't able to get um, uh, samples from both blood and tissue for any of them. Uh, and that's not because it wasn't collected. It was collected over the years, but a lot of it was used. Uh, and, and that's sort of one of the issues about a tumor repository. You can't kind of get stuff and keep it forever. It gets used for studies. And so that's one of the tricky things, especially for rare diseases. Um, so we have just sequenced all of these and we are awaiting the results. Um, and maybe we will in fact find that there are other, other mutations that really predict, uh, or, or I should say prognosticate, uh, the development of, of renal medullary carcinoma. Uh, and hopefully that would be the case because again, we, we know very little about the biology and we have really very poor treatments for these diseases. All right, um, I'm gonna move on and talk about uh, a database study that we did, again, based on uh, on, on really the database studies that were done through the GU tumor repository. So there's been an interest uh, at Yale in brain metastases for a very long time. Uh, when Brian Shuck was here, he was interested in looking at them and we published this paper uh, looking at uh, all the brain metastases from kidney cancer that were found at Yale. Um, and this study, it was retrospective. Uh, we found 158 patients and all the way back to 2001 um, through 2018, uh, and, and, and the basic findings are that most of people who have brain mets are symptomatic. Most actually had metastatic disease elsewhere. And, and, and that was, it's useful information for the clinician. But to me, a much bigger question was, how do these patients compare to patients without brain mets, right? What we really want to know is, I think, is uh, when you're talking to a patient and they say, well, well what's the likelihood I'm going to get brain mets or, uh, you know, uh, or if I have brain mets, how does that affect my survival compared to not having brain mets? And so we did a much larger study and um, beginning back in 2012, when we had very good clinical information that we still have because Epic, that's around when Epic uh, became the system at Yale, we're able to actually look at every single renal cell cancer patient who metastasized and compare them, the ones with brain mets to those without brain mets. Um, so these are the patients, their characteristics. Uh, we found in the end fewer, right? Because we we're looking at, at the number of brain mets from about half the time we looked at before. Uh, so we found, um, I think, 74 of them, okay? Um, and there wasn't anything obvious based on patient characteristics that, that um, predicted the development of brain metastases, okay? Um, it, uh, gender didn't, race didn't, age, uh, 
at either a diagnosis of, of cancer or diagnosis of metastatic cancer um, or age of brain metastasis. Um, also, whether you had a nephrectomy or not, the only thing that seemed to kind of reach a little bit towards significance was grade. It looked as though the higher grades might be a little bit more likely, uh, but not so much. Uh, and a risk stratification by the IMDCC, which is what we use for all metastatic kidney cancers, also didn't, didn't show anything. Or whether you got systemic therapy or not didn't seem to show anything either. Um, it's worth noting that we found that of the people who had brain metastases, about 24% of them presented that way, meaning that their first uh, metastatic site was in the brain. Um, so that's a lot of them, obviously. And uh, in general, for people who develop brain mets, about 69% of them actually had symptoms. So a lot of these people are going to go with brain mets without symptoms. Um, and, and, and again, and we have, because of that, we've begun screening patients with the brain MRIs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but about half of our patients actually get screening brain MRIs. Oops. Okay. So the, the, the first curve I'm gonna show uh, from, from what we found from looking at all of our patients is just the cumulative overall survival from time of brain mets. Um, and you know, the, the key thing I think for patients to know uh, is that the median overall survival is, is under two years about 19 months. Uh, and you can see there's a tail on this curve, suggesting that there are some patients who will get brain mets who will be cured. Uh, and, and we do know that, that the treatment that we have, which we use these days, which is really primarily radiation directly to the site of metastasis. That is to, uh, we use gamma knife radiation therapy here. That's a lot of it's done by Veronica Chang, uh, along with, and she's uh, one of our neurosurgeons along with uh, a lot of some of the radiation oncologists that work together, often James Yu, but there are others. Um, and, and they can get relatively good control over brain metastases with that radiation therapy. That's probably why some of these people are gonna be cured. Um, but still, that's not a terribly long overall survival. So it's not a great sign. All right, so, now, actually comparing patients who got brain mets to those who did not get brain mets. This is all of our patients from 2012 onward. Um, the, the curve in red are those with brain mets, okay? The curve in blue are those without brain mets. And the overall survival, when you look at it, um, is somewhat different, right? Uh, the, it's about uh, uh, um, nine months better if you, have, if you do not have brain mets, all right? Uh, for, oops, screening is wrong, for, but for a hazard ratio of about 0.84 for death. Um, that is not statistically significant, all right? In fact, I'm gonna show you today, none of it actually meets statistical significance, but these are really hypothesis generating studies. As you know, as I said, there aren't a huge number of brain mets throughout Yale, but these are the kind of studies that you can look at, you can see if you think there's a, a biological signal there, and then use it to sort of do more definitive studies. I think what's more interesting than looking at overall what we see at Yale was to look at um, people who got immune checkpoint inhibitors or those who didn't. So what are immune checkpoint inhibitors? Um, immune checkpoint inhibitors are these very commonly used drugs in cancer now. Uh, we began using them just over 10 years ago in trials and they became standard of care in uh, kidney cancer back in about 2016, 2017. Uh, so, uh, and at Yale, we were using them long before that because many of our studies were on trials using these. Before the advent of these drugs, and, the, and they're drugs that, if you're not familiar with them, um, you've seen them on TV continuously. They're ads for Keytruda and uh, Optivo, which are uh, uh, respectively pembrolizumab and nivolumab. Um, I'm gonna talk actually a little bit later about what those drugs do. but um, prior to that, all we had were what were called the tyrosine kinase inhibitors or the VEGF receptor blockers. And those are drugs you may have heard of like sunitinib, uh, pizabinib, cabozantinib. Um, and so this curve, these, these two graphs separate out in the sort of pre-immune checkpoint inhibitor era versus the post-immune checkpoint inhibitor era. And what you see is that in the patients who, um, before we were using immune checkpoint inhibitors, the curves are really on top of each other. Brain mets didn't really make a whole lot of difference to survival. The overall survival was 17 months versus 20 months, um, and the log rank was 
this, the curve now, when you take people who've gotten immune checkpoint inhibitors, the curves separate a lot more. It's still not significant, okay? Though getting much closer to significance. Um, but the overall survival difference is really massive. It's really almost double if you don't have a brain metastasis. The other thing that you might have noticed is in the immune checkpoint era, all the survival is way better than it was in patients pre the immune checkpoint era. Um, and when you stick the two curves together, I'm sorry, those two graphs together, the blue and the green are the pre immune checkpoint era and the red and the orange are the post immune checkpoint era. And there's a massive difference. The log rank actually is undetectable. There's, it's a hugely significant finding. And so going, going back a slide actually, why might it make no difference to brain mets before we were using immune checkpoint inhibitors? And my hypothesis, uh, I, I think the reason is that tyrosine kinase inhibitors just aren't that effective alone as drugs. And so people were dying of their systemic disease. When you get into the modern era, we're getting so much better control over the disease outside of the brain that brain mets are probably now killing people. So moving forward again, I think what, what we can suspect based on these things, we can't really make conclusions, right? Um, but that immune checkpoint inhibitors have really massively improved survival in patients with kidney cancer, whether they've got brain mets or not. But in addition to that, it, it almost certainly works a lot better systemically than it does in the brain. And um, all the more reason why we're studying brain mets here, because that is a huge problem, and I think it's going to be continue to be a huge problem. Um, Brings us to the question of, should we be screening for brain mets? Um, when we looked at patients who we screened versus those who we didn't screen, okay? That is, they were discovered by having symptoms. Again, there was a pretty big difference in overall survival, all right? And the hazard ratio for screening was 0 0.56, meaning that your likelihood of death was almost uh, twice as fast um, if, you, if, you, if we didn't screen you. And so you might ask, well, why weren't you screening everybody? Uh, and the answer is that insurance companies only variably cover screening. So we screen whoever the insurance allows us to screen. Um, but I think this, although again, the data are speculative, uh, we don't have statistical significance, again, because the numbers are small. I mean, we may not have significance because it may not be a real finding, but it does seem consistent with what we find across the board. Um, we think this suggests that, that we really should be screening patients and we're gonna continue doing it for everybody. But I think this suggests we really should be doing a large scale study to find this. Because um, the idea behind this, the hypothesis is really that when you catch these things earlier, it is much easier to radiate them. And you can radiate a smaller area of the brain, which will result in fewer side effects. People who do get brain radiation, they often will have uh, necrosis at the site of, of that, of the, of, the, of the radiation. They'll require uh, steroids to prevent swelling. When you're on steroids, you can't be on immune checkpoint inhibitors. They don't work in people who are on steroids. Um, and this can be debilitating. So um, I, I think there's probably a real signal here that we should sort of be looking at. Again, the data are suggestive. We should really be screening patients with brain MRI so that we can change our management. Mike, can I ask a quick can I ask you a yeah, yeah, question totally. about that? What are your th what are your thoughts about um, the possibility of that just being kind of Will Rogers phenomenon? Meaning, you know, like um, the idea that if you go back that slide, that there's yeah. two different groups there, um, since it's not a randomized group, um, that the group of uh, those that you screened might include, you know, by necessity, then includes asymptomatic people, maybe small brain mets that may never have caused them an issue. And then the other group is just a worse group of symptomatic brain mets. And that there's a whole population of people out there with small brain mets that are probably not gonna cause them an issue that um, we're now diagnosing. But you're seeing that separation in curves, not because of the screening, um, but because of um, the differences in those two groups. You're absolutely right. That, that's what I was, I was trying to sort of say that. You said it sort of more, uh, more fully, went through the arguments a bit more. Uh, that's why we need to do, that's why I think this really does need to be studied though. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I don't, so, so Will Rogers effect, sure, right? Um, the, the, I, I think it's less likely that we are selecting those patients because we're really not, we, we try to do it on everybody. 
and the insurance company you know, selects for us who we can actually do. Um, but so I don't think there's a, but, but again, we can't prove that. There might be some sort of selection bias. Right. But there's plenty of people you've screened who, or who fall out here because they quote unquote don't have brain mass, right? It's the same thing we do with extended lymph node dissection and why, why you know, we're, we're not seeing much in the, when we've studied it in a randomized fashion, we're not seeing much signal that extended versus standard right. node dissection helps. I think it's the same potential problem. Absolutely. Any, any, absolutely. We, we need to look at it more, but I think that it's just sort of, I think it really means we should look like seriously, as opposed to, um, you know, in a tiny study, you know, we could do it something much, much larger, but again, it would have the same issues. Um, the only difference I think between what we did and what you see when you see these very large database studies that are done that people are much more excited about are that those studies, they haven't even looked back into the charts and really seen what was done. Um, and, and so and those studies I think are very flawed for all the reasons you bring up because they really can't get around those confounders. Um, but, but, I, but yes, I totally agree. I think that this is suggestive we should look seriously. Um, the last two slides I want to show from these data were just that um, we did to look to see that how long it actually takes for these things to develop. So uh, in patients who do eventually develop METs in the brain, the median time development is about 13 months after they develop metastatic disease. We've, we've already taken out the ones who uh, already had metastatic disease initially, right, uh, in the brain initially. So we, 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 we censored all the patients who were diagnosed with brain mets at first. And of those who were left over, it takes about 13 months on average for those to develop. And about 75% of those will develop mets by about 31 months after the development of metastatic disease. But I think the point is that, to, to my take home from this, is that you can, you're never really out of the woods. Even 25% of the patients can have a long time after they develop metastases can develop brain mets. Um, and as I said, it, this excludes those who, who present with, with brain mets. And the last thing that sort of came out of these data that really doesn't have to do with brain mets, but I thought was interesting, was looking at just the timing of any metastasis after we take out kidney primaries. So we looked at all the patients uh, who had a primary kidney cancer uh, and then, um, you know, recurred. And what we normally do for these patients, I think usually is we watch them for about five years afterwards. That's kind of the, 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 the lifespan of looking at patients uh, and really across cancers who have had a disease locally, it's been removed. And after five years, we sort of say, you're kind of home free. Turns out when you look at when people develop metastases, you're really not home free. Um, although the median time from curative resection to metastasis was only 28 months. So around, you know, just after two years, half the people will recur before that and half the people will recur after that. Um, at five years, only about 70% of our patients had, had recurred. Um, and so a full, almost a third of our patients will recur far after that. Does that mean it makes sense to continue surveilling them? Not necessarily, because it doesn't mean it's gonna necessarily change the outcome. But it just is worth noting that it's probably something that it's worth patients knowing if they ask. Um, and, I, and I haven't seen these data before, so I just thought that was sort of nice information. Okay, I'm going to finish now by talking about some studies that we have. Um, three studies that are open, two of which I think uh, I, I, um, I think you guys know a lot of a lot about about one of them because we've talked about it a fair amount. But uh, two of them I think we're really, really actually looking to you to help us recruit patients, um, and one of which is just a study that's being done in renal that I thought I would bring up because. Um, Yale's pretty involved in that study. Um, before we get into that though, let me just say something about immunity because all of the kidney cancer patients you're gonna see who eventually end up metastatic, almost all of them will end up getting immune checkpoint inhibitors. And while in the cancer world, I think we're all pretty familiar with it, not everybody in the urology world is familiar with these drugs. Um, so at the very least, you'll understand a little bit more about the TV ads you see. So in adaptive immunity, um, you know, every cell in our body, every generic cell, is taking self proteins, chopping them up into little bits, okay, um, and into peptides. And those peptides are being stuck on a protein called MHC, or in humans it's called HLA. And these, this major histocompatibility protein complex, actually presents those peptides to 
uh, cells in the body. And we have T cells that randomly generate T cell receptors that recognize pretty much any shape you can imagine. Any peptide that's out there is, is, gener is recognized by some T cell receptor in our body. So you may ask, well, why aren't our T cells always recognizing our cells and attacking them? The reason is that if you have a good, strong interaction with a T cell receptor uh, by a T cell, it gets destroyed in utero, okay, in the thymus. However, when you have a bacteria or some other foreign thing invade, our generic cells are also taking their proteins and chopping those proteins up. And we will often have T cell receptors that recognize the combination of MHC and those foreign peptides. Um, and so you can get a really strong reaction, uh, interaction. Turns out that doesn't actually do anything. The T cell is not gonna kill cells based on that. It's not gonna go after those bacteria. You need a second signal, okay? And that second signal is one of two proteins usually called CD80 or CD86 that is made by the cell saying, I'm sick, please note there's something wrong with me. And we call that co-stimulation, okay? And the co-stimulation turns the T cell on via this thing called CD28. And once it's on, it will kill those cells. And that's great, that's the way the immune system works, okay. Um, so how can we use that to kill cancer cells though? Cancer cells, generally, most of the proteins they make look just like our cells, right? Um, look like, look like the, the proteins from our cells. However, when you get mutations in cancers, which you do, some of those proteins are gonna look slightly different. And that is probably how we primarily, our immune system recognizes cancer as foreign, okay? However, and I, it's unfortunate that I accidentally took those slides out. Let me see if I can go back. However, it turns out that, sorry, going back to here, there is something the opposite of co-stimulation. And the opposite is something called co-inhibition. It turns out that you don't want this to go on forever, right? You absolutely don't want your T cells to attack and destroy every single uh, uh, thing that it recognizes as foreign forever, or you will have massive inflammation all the time. And so the way we get around it is that over time, cells stop making CD80, CD86, and they start making something called PD-1. And PD-1 is recognized by something on T cells called PD-L1. I'm sorry, I don't have the slide. And that turns T cells off. So it turns out the cancer cells have largely figured out, many of them, to make PD-1 and PD-L1. So even though they're recognized by T cells as bad and foreign, the T cells are turned off by that PD-L1 signal. And all these new immunotherapies that we're seeing essentially stop that interaction. They break the PD-1, PD-L1 interaction, allowing the T cells to kill, all right? So the first trial I wanna talk about and um, is something called the PROSPER RCC trial. Uh, a lot of you people know about the trial and I know that because you guys have sent us patients. It's phenomenal, you guys have done really an amazing job. I think that um, you guys have sent us more patients than we can get on our own for other trials that we're trying to do. This is a phase three trial a randomized study comparing perioperative nivolumab versus observation in patients with localized RCC um, getting nephrectomy. So at the moment, there is one drug approved for adjuvant therapy for people who've gotten nephrectomy. That drug is sunitinib, one of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, it is minimally effective. It has a progression-free survival of about 1.3 months. Uh, has no overall survival difference. Nobody I know recommends it. I certainly don't recommend it. But the question is, is giving patients an immune checkpoint inhibitor around the time of uh, resection, will that actually result in more cures? This is the study. We register patients, uh, do a biopsy to prove that it's renal cell carcinoma, they get randomized. Half of them are just gonna get no standard of care, which is nephrectomy or partial nephrectomy. The other half, this is actually a slightly old slide, they get one dose of immune therapy, nivolumab, then nephrectomy, and then they get uh, you know, 12 doses. Um, this is actually also slightly changed. It's now 10 doses of every four weeks. And the patients have to either have C2, right? So greater than four centimeter tumors, or they have to have positive lymph nodes, okay? And they can have clear cell histology, which is around 75% of all kidney cancer, or they can have non-clear cell histology. Um, and so what we have been relying on, on, on the urology community you guys on is to 
when you find patients who might be eligible not to go ahead and do nephrectomy, but to send them to us to see if they would want to get the trial first, because the trial gives them nivolumab first, then nephrectomy, and then the rest of the nivolumab. And we've enrolled, I think, seven patients on this um, so far. Oops. Um, two have been enrolled recently. We screened a bunch of others recently, and for a while we weren't open during COVID. And when we opened up and we mentioned it to you guys, you've really been fantastic. And we've been getting really a steady stream of patients, but we'll be able to enroll, I think, a lot of patients on this trial. Um, and we're hoping for benefit. Just for the record, there is another trial that also is not yet read out, looking at a different immune therapy called atezolizumab um, in the adjuvant setting. This trial has the idea that if you want to train your immune system, before you get, get it, do it before the nephrectomy is done, because then we have lots of tumors sitting around for your immune system to get activated against. All right. Um, the second study that I was going to mention is something called the HCRNGU16260 study. This is a study of frontline. So you guys are also going to see frontline patients, that is, people in whom you've resected their kidney either through a, through a partial or a complete nephrectomy for kidney cancer, and you are following them out and they recur. So this is a phase two study looking at a, a, a different frontline therapy. So the standard of care right now for frontline therapy is a combination of nivolumab and something called ipilimumab, a different immune checkpoint inhibitor, um, or a combination of an anti-PD-1 drug like nivolumab with a VEGF receptor blocker. These combination trials, uh, uh, sorry, combinations are very effective um, but they're, they're pretty toxic. They can be quite toxic. And so the question of this trial is actually, can we get away with less therapy? So the question is, can we start with just nivolumab alone, in which about 80 to 90% of patients will have very few symptoms at all? And then if they progress, can they get salvage? It'd be NEVA, okay? This is the study schema. Um, this study also enrolled non-clear cell carcinomas and clear cells, but the non-clear cells have finished enrolling. And so now we're only enrolling clear cell carcinoma. But again, if you're thinking of patients who have recurred um, and, and they may not want, you, you're really worried about side effects for these patients, they're probably ideal candidates for this trial. Lastly, I'm gonna talk about CAR T cells, which maybe a lot of you have heard of, maybe all of you have heard of. It's sort of the hottest thing in cancer. Um, and we have a CAR T trial. This is for later stage disease. Um, it's based on the fact that, as I said, the T cell receptor is key for um, our T cells to discover and kill off cancer. Um, T cells only recognize proteins. They only recognize proteins if they're presented by that protein I was saying before, MHC. Remember, MHC takes the peptides um, and, and, and um, presents them to the T cell receptor. As I said, it also requires that costimulatory signal. Um, and the signaling is through these other chains. Okay. Antibodies work quite differently, right? They recognize any antigen. They can recognize sugar. They can recognize strange fats. They don't require MHC. And their interaction is way stronger than the TCR interaction. They're, they're literally 1,000 to 10,000 fold stronger than T cell receptor interactions. So someone had the very bright idea to say, well, why don't we take a T cell receptor, the part that signals, chop off the end that recognizes things, and stick an antibody on the end of it. And this thing represents an antibody. And they did that. And sure enough, it didn't do anything. And the reason it didn't do anything is for the same reason I said before. T cells will only get turned on if you have a costimulatory molecule. So someone said, okay, let's stick part of the costimulatory molecule on there. And they did that. Um, and that worked like gangbusters. And then the third generation ones where they stuck two different costimulatory things on. And the fourth generation is to do it while adding a bunch of other genes into the cells. And this has cured um, you know, children with certain leukemias, it has not been as effective in solid tumors, uh, but we're now testing it in kidney cancer. Um, it's a pretty involved process. So you have to isolate T cells from patients, then you have to activate them, then you have to actually put in this molecule that we've created, which is, by the way, called a chimeric antigen receptor. That's what CAR stands for. And then you re-expand these things, put them back into the patient, these patients have to get a lot of chemotherapy to remove the endogenous immune system so that there's room for these things to grow and that so the suppressive parts of the immune system are gone. Um, and there's a whole set of new side effects. So you have to do it at a place that knows how to do it. We do know how to do it. 
Um, and therefore, we're opening the first uh, in the world CAR T cell uh, trial with um, an anti CAR T against something called CD70, which is found on uh, kidney cancers. Uh, and we're doing it here at about six other sites. We've enrolled one patient. Um, and as I said, there's this very complicated thing where you screen patients, they get their chemotherapy for several days, then you wash them out. Um, what's notable about this uh, is that this is a very fancy CAR-T product where they've actually, they're also genetically modifying our own cells. And I'm sort of out of time and it's uh, a little bit off topic anyway, but um, we're using something called CRISPR to actually um, take people's cells and make them so that cells can go into anybody's body. So we're not using their own cells, we're using sort of a stable of cells that, that have been created um, that will not be recognized as foreign by people. Um, and so it's really a new type of cell product. Um, and I, I'm not gonna go into it in much more detail, but just to say that this is something that's being worked on at Yale, the lab of C.D. Chen um, is doing this now and we're working with them, we have a grant to study this in people um, in kidney cancer specifically. All right, um, sorry. I'm just gonna finish off by saying by, by thanking people because I'm out of time here. Um, so the cell therapy dart, these are the people who, who make the, the CAR T study possible. Um, the melanoma renal dart, these are the people uh, who are doing the clinical studies I'm talking about. These people, Katrina Bizak and Kylie Kuck and the nursing staffs are the ones that allow us to do CAR T type studies. Again, all the stuff I talked about at the beginning was done by the people at the GU tumor repository with the fellow Brighton Considine. Um, Michael Leitman has been helping us a lot, looking at, um, he's collaborating with us on the um, retrospective kidney cancer study, City Chen's lab, and again, um, this is one of the people doing the research. So thanks a lot, folks. Uh, when I didn't go over, but took a lot of time. I don't know if there are any questions. Mike, that was great. Thanks very much. Sure. All right, thanks, folks.